story you can read later. But now we want to turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 4. We'll be looking at the entire chapter, Acts chapter 4, title of our study, The Test of Persecution. As will often be the case as we go through the book of Acts, Acts chapters 3 and 4 are actually one continual story. In Acts chapter 3, well, Peter and John go up to the gate beautiful. They see a man who for 40 years, we learn here in chapter 4, has been unable to walk. And he looks at Peter and John hoping to receive something from them. Silver and gold have I none, Peter says, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And, and of course he does, and he goes leaping and praising. A crowd gathers. Peter preaches the gospel. Whole thing very successful. And so Peter passes the test of success. He gives God all the glory as he shares that it was Jesus and the power of Jesus' name and the, the, the faith that comes through Jesus that enabled this man to now be walking. Well, in Acts chapter 4, we then see Peter and John facing another test. And that's a test you are certain at some point to face. In fact, we'll tell you why and show you in a moment. But let's just take a look. Verse 1 says, Now as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead and they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening however many of those who heard the word believed and the number of the men came to be about five thousand peter is just finishing his sermon and all of a sudden he sees the priest the captain of the temple and the sadducees surrounding them Peter and John are arrested and they're taken and held over till the next day for trial. It reminds me of something Paul will write later to young Timothy, a young pastor. He says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's important to note, he says, all... And that includes you if you're thinking, well, I don't know if I am that godly. He doesn't even say you have to be doing a good job at it. He says, if you desire to live godly, you will, in fact, suffer persecution. And Jesus basically spells out for us in the Gospels where the three major areas of persecution will come from. We'll see that, well, Persecution can and will come from the world. And when Jesus speaks of the world, he's talking about, um, well, not just people in the world, but those who've bought into the philosophies of the world, that ever-changing morality and, and, and the, well, the idea that values aren't solid or concrete, that you have yours and I have mine, and, and what I think or what you think, no, it's all about what God has to say about any and everything. So Jesus says we're going to deal with the world. We're also going to have to deal with the religious establishment. And we'll see he deals with both. And then these guys, by the way, dealing with both. And then there'll be issues at home as well. Well, I want to talk about Jesus for a moment. He says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. He goes on to say, if you were of the world, the world would love you. But because I chose you out of the world, well, therefore the world hates you. Remember, a servant isn't greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they love me, they'll love you. So Jesus says we can expect persecution from the world now is it possible to avoid persecution well i guess it's possible but if persecution comes as a result of a desire to live godly or even better living a godly life 
Well, wouldn't we want to embrace whatever God brings our way? Persecution in Jesus' case, persecution in Peter and John's case, actually led to greater opportunity and greater ministry. And so we're going to see the same thing will be true of us. So Jesus says, listen, those who embrace the world's ideas and ideals and values or lack thereof, they are going to hate you because they hate him. Jesus, if you remember the story at one point, gives sight to a man born blind. It sets up a major confrontation with the religious leaders. And this becomes very important to our study this morning because the guys that Peter and John are standing before, they're the very same guys that held the council that condemned Jesus and sent him to the cross. So Jesus, at this one point, it's somewhere in John, I believe, around John 9, he heals a man born blind. And, and, well, the religious leaders kind of get on that guy. Jesus has left the scene, and they come and they say, hey, what's happened here? And, you know, what do you, what do you say about him? And the man born blind just says, well, I think he's a prophet, He doesn't know all that he's going to find out about Jesus. But at this point, he just says, I think he's a prophet. So they send for the guy's parents. And the parents come and they say, is this your son who you say was born blind? And they said, uh, and then how then does he see? So they say, well, he's clearly our son and he was born blind. But how he sees? Well, he's of age. You just ask him. Why wouldn't they share what he had shared with them? Well, it's very simple. The religious leaders of Jesus' day and of Peter's day had already determined if anyone confessed that Jesus was the Christ, they would be put out of the synagogue. These two, this blind man's parents, they were trying to avoid the religious persecution that was certain to come if they said, well, yeah, he's our son. And by the way, from what I'm hearing, Jesus healed him. Well, In any case, they faced and will face persecution from the world and will face persecution from those who are religious but don't have an actual relationship with the Lord, who aren't submitted to the foundational truths of God's word. So when we say right is right and wrong is wrong, that there's black and white, it's it's concrete, that, that values are absolute and unchanging. Well, the world says we don't see it that way. And many religious people, unfortunately, are are, are more in the camp of the world than, than in the biblical camp where the Lord wants us. Well, here's the problem. I can armor up against the world, putting on the full armor of God, taking the sword of the Spirit, because I know I'm going to have to battle with the world. And and I can armor up with religious people, knowing that we're not all going to see eye to eye. And But... But none of us expect to have to armor up with our family. And Jesus actually says at one point, your enemies will be those of your own household. No, I know not everyone here has found that to be true. Some of you were raised by real Christians. Some of you are third or fourth generation Christians. I've shared my testimony with you before. My dad was someone who took me to church but never had a commitment to the Lord, not until after I came to Christ. And when I came to Christ and realized, hey, you need a real relationship with the Lord, Dad, I went and told him. He didn't really receive it with the kind of joy I expected him to. When I told him he needed to repent and be born again, he's like, who are you to be telling me these kinds of things? I'm I'm like... I'm somebody who's just repented and been born again, you see. But but if you've been down that road, if if you've been the first in your family or or maybe not all of your family are Christians, and so you have come to Christ and you are growing in Christ, and and listen, I can almost guarantee that that many of you have had this said to you. In fact, I'll ask you, how many of you have ever had someone say, oh, you just think you're better than me? I got to see the hands. That's a lot of you. And and I'm actually glad to see them because I was worried that it was just the Saturday night and first service people. (laughs) Here's the deal. 
people say that and, and they say it because they're making some assumptions about you that absolutely aren't or shouldn't be true. They're assuming that because you don't want to go there or look at that or smoke that or drink that or do this or do that, all those things you used to have in common with them that now you think you're so much better than them. And the reality is we know we're not better than anybody. If we're saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. How could we boast about who we are or the changes we've made? No, he began the good work and he'll be faithful to complete it. So the, the test that Peter faced last time, we're going to always be facing as well. The test of success as we grow in Christ, as we say no to things we have no business partaking of or participating in. As we continue on with the Lord, we're going to grow and we're going to succeed and, and we're going to have to face that test of success. Then we're going to have to face the test of persecution. And it's the world and it's the religious establishment of the world or the worldly, religious, self-righteous establishment. And then it's people at home. And in every case, the answer will be the same. We armor up. We put on the full armor of God. We take up the sword of the spirit and we fight the good fight of the faith. Well, it came to pass, verse 5, on the next day. Their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they'd set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? couple of things. Already mentioned, this is the same council that condemned Jesus and sent him to be crucified. So this would be a bit intimidating, even if you're Peter, even if you're John. But there are a couple other major issues. Take note, they don't even acknowledge it's a miracle. They won't call it a miracle. They don't call it a wonder or a sign. They call it this. By what power or by what name have you done this? Now, later in verse 16, and we'll read it in just a little while, they will, in fact, acknowledge that a notable miracle has taken place. But they do that privately, you see. Now they're in public, and they're not about to even give this miracle the credence it deserves. So they want to know, by what power and by what name have you done this? Well... It's interesting to me as a Bible student that these guys had so much going for them. I mean, the religious establishment here, and yet they act like they're completely ignorant. Do you know that their forefathers had the law? I mean, the law was given to and through Moses. And when they disobeyed the law, God sent his prophets. And when the prophets were disobeyed and disregarded and in many times murdered for simply saying, thus says the Lord, repent and turn back to the Lord. Well, God continued to show his grace and patience in sending John the Baptist, who comes and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So, so track with me. These guys have this as their history. They have the law, they have the prophets, they have the testimony of John the Baptist, they have the miracles and the, the teaching and the, the, the uh, death of Jesus and the testimony that he had risen from the dead. And with all that, they're still unbelievers. But that's not my point. My point is God's still trying to reach them. He brings Peter before them, knowing Peter will boldly preach the gospel. And we're going to see he does just that. This is a testimony to the patience and the goodness and the grace of our Lord. And many of you, well, you get this completely. You see, we have everything they had and more. We have the law and we have it written down. We can carry it with us. We have the prophets. We have the testimony of John. We have the, the life of Jesus. We have the apostles' testimony. We even have the book of Revelation. We know how the whole thing's going to end. 
And yet with all that and the fact that we can carry it around with us or have it on our computer or now on our smartphones, with all that, some still continue to, well, rebel against the Lord, to resist the, the proddings of the Holy Spirit. And the miracle of miracles is that God continues to pursue people who continue to run from him and resist him. Well, they ask the questions and Peter answers, verse 8, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, and I can't help but sent some sarcasm in his response. Now, it may not be there. I may be reading it in. I'll admit it to you. I'm a bit sarcastic from time to time. My wife is always reminding me that's not a gift of the Holy Spirit, but it is a gift. And, and I can't help but see it here. Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if this day we are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, you, you see it? It's like, so bizarre that they're even on trial because what have they done? They've touched somebody who for 40 years couldn't walk. They, they've raised him up. He, he's now walking. He won't have to beg anymore. He can work. He can, he can thrive. And, and then they preach that they did it in Jesus' name and now they've been arrested and now they're on trial. And the question is by what power or what name? Well, he says... If we're this day judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he's been made well, let it be made known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. Now, there were a couple things that take place here, and I don't want you to miss it. Peter goes right to the heart of the message. And I want to talk in a moment about evangelism and the importance of it, and, but, but I want you to see this because it's, it's so beautifully portrayed in the passage. Peter doesn't know how long he's going to get to talk. And so he's not taking any chances, you see, He's thinking, okay, I'm going to get the gospel into the first paragraph, into my introductory remarks. That way, if they stop me and they beat me or they kill me, which was possible, remember who he's standing before, at least he got to tell them the good news. And don't miss this. He not only shares that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, obviously buried, but then risen again the third day. He gives us all that. But he says, not only was he crucified, he says, you crucified him. Wants to make sure that they know, he knows, God's holding them responsible for this great sin. But he says, you crucified him, but God raised him from the dead, and it's by him this man stands before you whole. This is Peter and John, by the way, passing the test of persecution. And years and years ago, I read an illustration. I think it was C.S. Lewis. If not, well, I just can't remember who. But, but it basically portrayed persecution as like walking into the wind. The storms that we face in this life, like walking into a gale storm wind or a hurricane type of wind. And basically, it, it goes like this. You have three possible options. You can lie down. And if you do, the storm will just pass right over you. The only problem with that is you're not going to make any progress. You can turn around and it will be like you're sailing. I mean, the wind will actually help you move out of the scene. But you absolutely get nowhere in accomplishing what you were placed before that storm for in the first place. And then the other option, you can walk headlong and head up into that storm. It's the most difficult of the choices, but the only one that can lead to fruit, the only one that spells faithfulness. And that's what we see them doing, walking headlong into the storm. It's a glorious picture. Well, Peter at this point continues on. He, he quotes from Psalm 118. They're well familiar with it. And they called Jesus two things here, the stone and 
our salvation. This is the stone, he says, which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Now, they knew the Old Testament called Jesus, well, called the Messiah, the Savior, the rock, and the rock of our salvation. And, and they know that the rock followed the children of Israel through the wilderness. And that rock provided water in their times of need. And we read in the New Testament, that rock was Christ. And that's what he's saying. He's the stone. But not just the rock that followed them. Not just the rock of our salvation. No, no he, he's the one who's building this temple made without hands. And he himself, the chief cornerstone of that temple, well... He also tells them in verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No, if you evangelize, I don't say if you're an evangelist, because I know we're not all evangelists. If you're unfamiliar with the term, it simply means one who preaches or proclaims the good news of the gospel. We preach the good news. Now, I say not that we're all evangelists because Paul writes to Timothy and says, do the work of an evangelist. What's the work of an evangelist? To proclaim, to preach the good news. Now, if you evangelize, well... I want to tell you, well done, because God has called all of us to take the good news of the gospel that was given to us freely and pass it on to others. If you don't, I'm concerned about why. If you do evangelize, I'm concerned about how. So let's talk about why. Why would I share the gospel with anyone? Well, I was dead in trespasses and sin, and somebody came and shared the good news of the gospel with me. Now I'm on my way to heaven instead of hell. Now I'm walking in the light instead of darkness. Now I know there's absolute truth when I used to be just like everyone else who said, well, whatever's good for you is good for you. Whatever you do and your privacy, well, that's your problem or your issue. No, that's not true. We are connected. And we're seeing that more and more. While we lost it culturally... We're starting to understand it in a much uni more universal sense. What happens across the seas affects us, and what happens here affects people all over the world. But bringing it back home, the reality is we should all share the gospel because God gave us the gospel through someone. Listen, if I had it and I gave you a million dollars and then said, listen, one thing, if you give the million away, I'll give you two million. And then you did it. And I said, good job. Listen, you give the two million away, I'll give you 10 million. And then you said, I'm starting to like this. Then, then so you give the 10 million away. I say, okay, listen, you give that 10 million away, I'll give you 100 million. And, and wouldn't it make sense to give it away? Or would you say, well, I don't know. I never had a million dollars. How do I know I'm going to get two out of the deal? Well, you wouldn't with me, that's for sure. You're not going to even get the first. It's just an illustration. I think we all understand that. Now, if you want to talk about 10 bucks and work our way up to 100, maybe. But, but you have been given a gift that is worth more than a million, more than 5 million, more than 10 million, more than 100 million. You have been given the free gift of everlasting life. And if you don't share that gift, well... I think some of us don't share because we're just worried about how people will react or respond to us. And you need to know that Peter is more concerned about what's going to happen to those who crucified Jesus than what's going to happen to him. Remember, he's in a truly threatening situation. We're in a relatively comfortable one right now. But you can find yourself in a place where you know you should be sharing or you feel you should be sharing or you think you should be sharing. And if you're feeling, thinking, or knowing, I would share. And as I know some of us feel things and some of us know things and some of us think things, but either way. Now listen, if you do decide to share the gospel, and my prayer is that you will, 
make sure that you don't fall into the trap that some have. My, my buddy Danny Lehman talks about a couple types of evangelizing that, well, they really do misrepresent the Lord. The first is Frankenstein evangelism. Just the terminology tells you it can't be good. Now, if you're young and you've never heard of Frankenstein, Google them. And, uh, you know, you can find out all you need to know. But Frankenstein evangelism is all about trying to scare people into the kingdom of God. It appeals to fear. Now, we are to fear the Lord and respect the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of knowledge. But fear of the Lord does not automatically bring people to repentance. Lots of people fear, but they don't respond. And if people do respond out of fear, well, there's more coming, see. We can't say, well, you know, just fear the Lord and, and come to the Lord because now they're going to have to deal with the world and they're going to have to deal with the religious and they're going to have to deal with their families. And, and so I'm just saying I don't think Frankenstein evangelism rightly at all can represent the one who came as the prince of peace and suffered and died so we could find peace with God and be at peace within. Then there's Santa Claus evangelism. I'm dead against this too. If you're unaware of it, that's the bribe them kind of evangelism. It appeals to men's greed. And the idea is if you'll come to Christ, everything you want is yours. I mean, you get the master card, the master's card, and whatever you want, you just ask for it. Here's a promise right here. says he has to do it. And, and, and if... If you know people who say they tried Jesus and he didn't work, oftentimes they were led to believe that anything they want, they would get. Like, like God just becomes their genie and in Jesus' name is magic words. But the reason Santa Claus evangelism is devastating is ultimately people realize that I don't get whatever I want. That was never the purpose of prayer anyway, was it? You're students of Scripture. You know better. Prayer isn't about getting our will done in heaven. It's about getting God's will done on earth. So I do believe and I practice friendship evangelism. Here's what you need to know. Many methods, but the message has to be the same. Methodologies can change, but the message has to be the same. There's one gospel, there's one Savior, there's one name given among men whereby we must be saved. Friendship evangelism is a very effective tool for bringing people to Christ and making disciples of them. There is one drawback to it, and that is, well, it takes time. And some of us sometimes think, well, I have all the time in the world. I'll befriend this guy. And by the way, Chico State, people come here from over a hundred nations and they'll be at Chico State this fall. I want to encourage every one of you who can reach out to an international student. If you want to know how to do it, just go over to the campus and say, hey, how do I get involved with international students? They'll direct you and then just make an appointment. If they dig coffee, say, hey, let's get together for coffee. If they like tea, well, some people do. We'll talk more about that. But, but uh, you know, th the whole idea is you befriend them and be a real friend to them. A and then you want to share your testimony with them. You want to share what Jesus has done for them. But, but here's the one problem I have, and I'm not saying friendship evangelism at all should be off the table. I know that we don't always have as much time as we think we might. Years ago, and Pam just brought this to my remembrance, it was timely. Years ago, we were doing a home fellowship in Fountain Valley. That's just in the inside of Huntington Beach where we were living, and then prices started going up, and then it was Fountain Valley, then it was Santa Ana, and God used all that to prepare us for Yuba City. But in any case... <laughs> We were in Fountain Valley, and, and, uh, and we were doing a home fellowship. The room we were in was rather large, but it was narrow and, and super long, so there were a lot of people in the room, and, and they were all like this, and I was sitting kind of in the middle, so I'd be able to see everybody to the best of my ability, and, and there was a young gal sitting across from me. She'd come a couple times. I didn't really know her well. There were already about 40 or more people coming to the home fellowship, and so, for some reason, in the middle of the teaching, 
I all of a sudden just felt like I need to ask her if she wants to give her life to the Lord. And so with every eye open and every head up, you know, I just looked at her and I said, do you want to give your life to the Lord right now? And she said, you know, I think I do. And people were kind of, first they were kind of like, oh, this is a little weird and embarrassing. And then when she said she wanted to, they're like, wow, that's weird and kind of wonderful. But so, so I prayed with her and she gave her life to the Lord and we all rejoiced. And then we went back to the Bible study. Now, within a week, this gal had gotten in an accident and, and died. And, and so I share this with you and I'm so grateful that I get to share this story. Because it could have been, I felt this prompting and, and I felt like I should ask her, but I didn't want to embarrass her. I didn't want to make other people feel awkward or, or what if she didn't respond. So if I hadn't asked the question, oh, does that mean she automatically would have died without Christ? No, I, I could do what I do and you do and pray that somebody would have talked to her, that maybe the ambulance driver or, or, or the first person on the scene or maybe someone in the hospital or... But see, we never know. And my point is, if I waited and thought, well, I, I'll just befriend her in over the weeks and months, she's going to hear it week after week. I gave an invitation when I was very young in the Lord because I saw the value of it. But after that experience, I was fully committed that every time I opened the word of God or had opportunity that, that I was going to proclaim the gospel. And that's the, the other style here. It's proclamation. Uh, evangelization and, and that's talking about gathering people together however you can get them and then just sharing the good news of the gospel now listen there is a very simple way to do this that's non-threatening at least to most people and that is just share your personal testimony many of you know my little brother Tony's in London he's planting a church he took a team of people with him and what they've been doing is just befriending people in the area where they're living they just go to the restaurant and they hang out they hang out for a half hour they hang out for an hour they buy something and my brother he's a little strange many of you've met him he'll befriend the people and then after time he'll say hey why don't you just sit down here let me wipe those tables for you let me do this for you let me do that for you I've been in restaurants so many times with him. He always does this. Here's something I'd encourage you to do. He always says when the waiter or waitress comes back, you know, they come and they ask you for your water thing and or whatever you're drinking, and then they come back, and, and, and he always says the same thing. He says, hey, we're going to pray for our meal here, and is there anything we could pray for you for? And, and listen, you always get a response to that. I mean, sometimes people are like just, you know, deer in the headlights, eyes, and they're like, Pray for me, I mean, right here, right now, you know, it's, I'm waiting on you. But, but many times that I've been with them, I, I, I've noticed that people will just start to share their hearts and, yeah, I just got news that grandpa's in the hospital or this is going on or, or this issue. And I've met so many people with him and just learned a lot about him in a very short time just because he's willing to ask is there something we can pray for you? Well, what he's been doing over there with this team is they go and they just meet people and as soon as he can, and that's why this reminded me of him, as soon as he has opportunity, not knowing how much time he'll have, he says, hey, do you got a few minutes? I'd like to share my testimony with you. And, and he wants them to give him permission. Now, some people don't even know what a testimony is, and so they're just curious, and they're like, well, sure, you know. And, and then they, are, they hear it, and you're back to the deer in the headlights, you know. And, but, but, but the deal is, and you know London's a mess. I've shared with some of you, they went, my brother found this big, beautiful, glorious, ornate church, and it's empty. No one's meeting in it. So he went to find out, how do we rent it? And they said, to do what? And he said, to hold church, you know? And, and they said, oh, no, it's against the law to have religious uh, services in that church. And I'm like, man, do they need him badly? And, and, and so he's meeting in a, a tea house, it turns out. I told you we'd get to the tea. Yeah, he, he likes tea, so this works out really good for him. And, and, and so he's holding church in a tea house because apparently it's not illegal to have church in a tea house in London. But what he's been doing is sharing his testimony. And every time people come, he shares the gospel. And that's why you always hear me and every person who gets up here for me Open the word of God and then at the end say, is there anyone who wants to surrender your life to Jesus? Is there anyone who's been convicted of your sin and wants to say, Jesus, come into my life, be my life, my uh, Lord and Savior? Well, in any case, 
that's kind of what's going on with these guys. They're in the situation. Peter seizes the opportunity. He doesn't have time to give his testimony, so he just goes right to the heart of the gospel. Now take note in verse 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Those words uneducated and untrained can be translated unlettered and illiterate. It's kind of how some, not all, there's some very good and, and some very godly professors at Chico State, but there are some that just, if they find out you're a Christian, they just kind of have these assumptions about Christians, you know, like you check your brain when you get to church and, and you never recover it after and, and, and just the, the kind of stuff that they just scorn you. Now, I'm, again, I'm not saying all of them. But that's the attitude that these guys had, you see. We're lettered. We're studied. We have degrees. We have the scrolls. We can read the actual Hebrew. And so it's, it's a serious issue. They, they, they perceive they're uneducated un, and untrained, but that's not what makes them marvel. What makes them marvel is they realize they'd been with Jesus. And listen, if I had the opportunity to say, well, here's where I went to school and here's where I got my degrees and here's why you should listen to me or just to say, listen, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I was lost and now I was, I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Man, I'd much rather just humble myself before him. Hey, I don't care if people think they're better than me. I don't care if you think you're better than me. You might be. But, but the reality is, I have been given a gift and I want to pass it on and I, I want you to have it and I want you to pass it on. Well, Israel's leaders, they face a serious dilemma now. They deliberate and they have to make a decision and we're going to see the decision they make. Seeing the man we read in verse 14 who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go outside out to the council or out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. You see it here? Made mention of it earlier. They won't say it publicly, but privately they just get together and say, man, we know what's happened. Everybody knows what's happened. There's no way to deny it. What do you think we should do? They go on to say, verse 17, but... So it spreads no further among the people. Let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Let us severely threaten them. It reminds me of what I'm hearing from some of our politicians, and it troubles me, and here's why. I've learned that those whose hearts are set to do good or those whose hearts are set to do evil, they will not be deterred by threats. You can't threaten Iran or you can't threaten a suicide bomber and say, hey, you bomb me, I'm going to... He doesn't care. He's about to blow himself up and you with him. Threats aren't going to detour someone whose heart is set on evil. And we need to be like Peter here because threats aren't going to detour those whose hearts are set on good. It's a wonderful example to us. It's a beautiful picture for us. Once more, these guys aren't asking the question, well, will it make us popular to share this? Or will it be safe to share it? They're only asking, is it right to share it? Is this what God called us to do? And that's what Peter and John say. It says they answered. I don't know how that works when you have two guys, but I'll let them work it out. I'm sure it worked. Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen 
and heard. Now note, they're not in rebellion here. They are showing great respect and they're walking in obedience to the one who saved them at the very same time. It's important that we see this lesson as well, that we take this home and chew on it. We're living in a season of great, well, anxiety among many people. And there is civil unrest and the potential for serious civil disobedience. And I want you to know the scripture is very clear on this point. We're to be subject to all those who are in authority over us because all authority comes from God. It's so important that we don't rebel against authority, that we're not called rebels. Well, they could call us that, but just make sure it's not true. Well, here's the deal. It appears these guys are saying, don't talk in Jesus' name, don't preach in Jesus' name, you just cease and desist. And they're like, well, you're going to have to figure this out, whether we should listen to you or listen to God, because we cannot but speak the words that we've been commanded to share. Is that rebellion? Not at all. Because, because here's the issue. It's not that there are loopholes. There aren't any. Some of you will remember W.C. Fields. Someone saw him reading a Bible one day. The story goes and said, hey, W.C., what are you doing? I, you don't look like, I never considered you a Bible reading guy. He goes, I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> the deal is there are no loopholes. But there are, there are exceptions. And here's the only exception to absolute submission to all who are in authority over us. When the commands of men contradict the commands of God, then like Peter, like John, we got to go with God. We got to say, listen, it doesn't matter what the culture says. It doesn't matter what the Congress says. It doesn't matter what the community says. God is always saying the same thing. Have you noticed that? Community standards, cultural standards are always shifting, but the word is always the same. That's why I trust it. I can't trust a community that says one thing 10 years ago and another thing now. So I trust him. And if God says, hey, this is true, it's true, this is righteous, it's righteous, this is unrighteous, this is ungodly, this is unacceptable, it was, is, and will always be. So God says, here's what I have for you. They're doing it. They're told to cease and desist. They say, that's not going to happen. With all respect, they just say, we have to obey the voice of God. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, verse 21, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they had heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, for truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and all the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Take note of what happens. They gather together with their friends. They, they report the things that had taken place. They raise their voices and they acknowledge first their relationship. They say, Lord, Lord. That, that says they're servants. They're submitted. And they're serving and submitted to the Lord. And then they're, they, they remind themselves. They don't have to remind God of who he is. They say, Lord, you are God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It speaks to the reality of his power to create and to sustain and save. And, and then they quote from Psalm 2. Why did the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? 
it was prophesied that it would happen. It happened again and again and again. And, and here it's the religious leaders, not the nations outside of the religious establishment. And again, the world, the religious, the, the, the family will battle against them all, sadly. There is something else. And we've seen it again and again, but we have a perfect picture of it here. There is a, a wonderful picture of man's free will working in perfect unity with God's absolute sovereignty. Man's free will? Yeah, these guys sinned against the Father and against the Son and sending Jesus to the cross. And yet they were demonstrating that God was in control all along because he planned and purposed and had it prophesied that Jesus, the Messiah, would suffer and die this very way. Does that mean that those who handed him over weren't guilty? No, of course they were guilty. They weren't saying, let's please God by crucifying his son. No, they were guilty and they were exercising their own free will, but God was exercising his sovereignty and using their sin to bring about his plan and purpose. And he does the same thing today. Theologians can argue about, well, which is it, free will or God's sovereignty? I would suggest it's free will and God's sovereignty that they go hand in hand. They work together perfectly. Now, Lord, they pray. Look on their threats, verse 29, and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Arrested, threatened, they pray, not for the destruction of their enemies, not for fire to come down and consume them, but for, for God to empower them and enable them to reach their enemies for him. Lord, empower us. Confirm your word with signs and wonders. And how does he answer? He fills them all with the Holy Spirit. And how do they respond? They spoke the word of God with boldness. My prayer for each and every one of you is that the very same thing will take place. As we pray, Lord, fill us today to overflowing. Let your goodness spill out and over us and, and let your mercy and your kindness and your truth and our testimony of all those things. Lord, give us opportunity to share you today and this week with people who desperately need to know what we know, who need the gift we've been given, this gift of life, life eternal, life abundant. Lord, thank you for this congregation that loves you and loves your word. And Lord, we do love the lost and, and for many different reasons, we find a way to avoid sharing with them. And Lord, we know someday they'll stand before you in judgment. And Lord, if it's wrong to use fear or threats or bribes to, to bring people to you, it certainly would be wrong to use fear or threats or bribes to get people to share you. Lord, just because you've been so good to us and because you've given us more than we could ever need or contain, would you overflow our lives today? And, and Lord, if there'd be even one person here who's never said, Jesus, I confess, I'm a guilty sinner and I repent of my sin. I turn from trusting in what I'm doing or what I've done or trying to be a good person or I just trust in what Jesus has done for me. I hear it. He suffered and died for my sin. He, he was buried and rose again. He gave his life, so I'll give mine. He suffered and died, so I'll live for you. And if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, would you do it today? And if you're ready to do so, just raise your hand and hold it high. By doing that, you're, you're saying, Sam, pray for me right now, right here. I want to give my life. I want to surrender my life. I want to confess my need for God's forgiveness. 
I'm not talking about joining a church. We have no membership. I'm not talking about becoming religious. You may already be that. I'm talking about obtaining a righteousness that is the gift of God. Anyone this hour, anyone this service. Lord, we look for hands, but you see our hearts. You know us perfectly. You know what keeps and what motivates us. And I pray you'd have your way in every heart here today, in every mind. If there are questions, I pray, Lord, they'll be answered. If there's a need for an example, let us be that example. And Lord, give us opportunity and bring to our remembrance how good you've been to us, that we could pass it on. Freely we've received, freely we'll give. In Jesus' name, amen.